Okay, so I think Matthew has said what the format's going to be, but we'll, we'll go through the little presentation, the PowerPoint presentation that I've got. And um, so I'll, I'll just be talking over that. And then once we've gone through that, then I'll do some demonstrations and uh, you can ask, ask away, um, ask questions away. So let's have a little look and see whether I can do this. Excellent. Okay. So, when it wants to follow me. Okay, so the lustres that you're working with, these are designed to go on top of your glazed fired ware. So you would paint whatever ware you are used, used to using. So most often it is um, just the regular earthenware um, pottery that you're using in your paint room pottery studios, but you can equally use it on other surfaces as well. So you can use it on porcelain and glass also, and you can use the same product um, that I'm going to be talking about. Um, there is specific lusters for glass, but I found that the Hobby Colorabia lusters that we're going to use um, work perfectly well onto other surfaces. So it needs to go onto a glazed fired surface that is already shiny, already fired. Now, you need to make sure that the piece is clean. Um, so when you take your luster pieces out of the kiln, you don't want to be overhandling them at all. So if you're taking mugs out of the kiln, pop your hand inside and try not to touch the hand or if you're going to put luster on the handle and try not to handle the outside of the piece too much. Um, this is because um, grease and salt and moisture are all enemies of the product, but I'll talk about that in a, in a moment. Also, but, you, you might want to just mention that if you're thinking you've got something in your studio that would look amazing with a little bit of luster on, if it's something that's been hanging around in the studio for a while, you might want to be cautious about um, putting it straight back in the kiln, I would suggest you might want to put it into a into the kiln room to make sure it's completely dry before you try and fire it with um, lusters on. Because if it's taken in moisture and you try and refire it, it will crack. Yeah. So on the earthenware pottery that you're used to using, we use the Paragon firing schedule, the, just the regular cone 018 firing and um, most of you got paragon kilns and so instead of pressing um, comb fire 06 which is normally what you do for your glaze firing you're just going to choose comb fire 018 and that's going to take you um, it's going to take you on the firing schedule that you see um, on the screen there so lusters want to be fired to um, 715 degrees centigrade so the firing schedule that the paragon kilns use is it goes up at 220 degrees per hour until it gets to 655 degrees and then it slows down it goes at 60 degrees per hour until it gets to 715 degrees now that's on the standard firing um, that the paragon kilns have we actually choose number one on the option so instead of firing on standard we fire on fast which is just 20 percent quicker which you can do because there's no moisture or, or organic materials that are coming out of the clay body um, so you can just pop it on the fast firing slow firing you would use for clay um, pieces potentially thicker heavier clay pieces so can i just um jump in a couple of questions um, can it go on to top of crystals and elements? That's a good question. Are you going to come on to that, Jane, or do you want to hit that one? I now? will come on to that later. I've got a specific slide about that. Okay, that's a good question. And the also, there's a question about does it go on matte glazes, which I know we're going to cover. And again, that's a really good yeah. question. And the fact, um, I, um, I think my microphone might be a bit odd at the moment. I'm trying to work on changing it. Sorry if it's a bit echoey. Okay. And really, really important is um, lusters 
stink. Okay, they stink when you use them and they stink when you fire them. So it's important to consider when you might be firing your kiln. So don't have the kiln firing whilst you've got mum and babies doing clay handprints in the studio. That first part of the firing, it's just awful. And this is why you located your kiln in a well ventilated space. Um, and and it's, it, it's not good for us humans to be inhaling. So we, you do need to make sure um, that it's well ventilated. This is part of the label. Um, and uh, it, it is, it's nasty stuff. Um, it's the, the, the full safety data sheets are on our website and you can go and download them from our website. Basically, you don't want to get it on you or in you and you don't want to be in prolonged contact with it, basically. Um, if you are pregnant or, um, uh, what did I say? Oh yeah, here it is. Um, so yeah, work in a really well ventilated space um, because you, you don't want the fumes to hang around. I've been in workshops with people before and people have fainted. Um, just the smell of it. I love it. I think it's an amazing smell. Um, but it, when you're sitting down, you don't notice it and you stand up and it's like, woohoo, you can get a little bit of a high on it um, from it. And it's also why it, we're going to be doing a demonstration a bit later. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to do it as late as we can. Yeah. Um, so I just want to say that this, it's a crossover product really with so much of what we do in um, contemporary ceramics is um, water-based, non-toxic, um, customer-facing. This this is a to top more toxic product, but there are ways that you can use it. And I, I implore you to use it because it is beautiful, but just, I think we've made the point that it is something you do need to be careful of if you're working with the public. Yeah, so it's not something that you do with kids and it's not something that you do with um, uh, you know pregnant women. Um, and there's there's reasons for that and the, and you can refer them to the safety data sheet um, as to why why you wouldn't want to do that um, I think it's a product that you use in, in the studio and you use it as a service product um, for your customers maybe um, and yeah I keep a plastic bag and I put all my rubbish in the plastic bag as I'm working and then I knock the plastic bag and um I take that out to the to the bin. I don't leave it in the studio. Um, you just got to consider the smell and then who's coming into the studio after um, after the event. So um, all important and all scary. Um, and I just need to I just need you to be aware because it's so much different than um, the stroke and coat and Bellissimo products that you're, you're that you're using normally. Okay, so. All of the Colorabia lusters, they come in a slightly concentrated format. They're not in a ready to use um, format. So we use the thinner, which is the clear product, and we add 50, well, five to 15% um, to the bottle of whatever it is that we're using when it's brand new. Now in the picture there, you can see that the luster, the brown luster in the in the picture, it was really gloopy. We had, um, I think it was the the gold. I hadn't used it for a year and a half, maybe, and it was like marmite. And I added, um, I added, I added the thinner to it. And I just dipped a brush into my thinner and then just wiped it on the top edge of the jar and then just mixed it with a cocktail stick you don't want to mix it with a brush because you're going to add air bubbles to the um to the product and that's we don't want that we want it to be nice and smooth um consistency and i i woke that sticky horrible product up and i used it and it's what i've used on the samples that i'm going to show you in a minute um, five to 15 percent it's kind of like a brush full you know it's it it's not something that we can easily measure with 
the files of gold being a two gram file of gold that you've got. Can I just, sorry, just a technical thing. Can I just jump in? Um, Sherry is saying she lost audio. Can I, I can see Alexis Harris. Can you give me a thumbs up? Can you hear? Yeah. Okay. What I would say is um, we are recording. So if you're having issues, don't worry. You can watch it back another time. Okay. Okay, so thinner is add five to fifteen percent, and I just add it with a brush. Dip the brush into the product, and then just wipe it on the top neck of the jar, and then use a cocktail stick just to mix it, and it comes back to life quite amazingly well. Um, I was quite surprised that I managed to wake it up and actually use it. Um, so, what's the difference between thinner and brush cleaner? Well, brush cleaner is orange. Um, you can use the thinner to clean your brush, but you can't use the brush cleaner to thin the product. They, they are basically the same product. Um, the brush cleaner is a bit more, uh, it does clean brushes better than the thinner does. It's a, it's a bit harsher um, and they color it so that you know that it's different. Uh, I like it being two, I, I like having two products because the clear product, I use a clean brush and I dip the brush into, you know, for the, for the thinner, I just dip a clean brush into the thinner and then add it to whichever luster that I'm using. The brush cleaner, it's orange in color. I can dip my whole brush, my whole dirty brush into the bottle of orange liquid. Um, and then I don't swish it. I just lift it back up again and then I wipe it backwards and forward on, on a piece of on a paper towel. I'll show you a little bit later. Um, but it means that my brush cleaner might be contaminated with various lusters. My thinner won't be contaminated. Um, and it does, it, the brush cleaner does clean your brushes much better. So to clean the brush, you wipe it back, exactly what it says on the page there, you wipe your brush backwards and forwards on a, on a clean paper towel to get as much of the luster out of your brush. You then dip the brush into the, into the orange cleaner and then on a new section of paper towel, you just wipe it backwards and forwards until it comes clean. And you just keep repeating that cycle until you get nice clean, um, uh, clean orange coming through. And now, then can I say you then, bag it and bin it and i know we keep making this point but if you don't and you, you'll leave the studio you come in the next day and the studio still smells so you need to have brushes that you keep specifically for lusters um because water is an enemy of lusters so uh, we we've got really lazy with our brushes we as you see in the picture there we have we have brushes that we use specifically for mother of pearl and others that we use for gold and others for silver or, or palladium. Um, and we put little stickers on the brush handles just so that what we, we know what we used last time. Um, the reason I did this is because I'd used a, uh, a blue luster on a piece and then I hadn't cleaned my brush properly. And then I picked and then I went straight into mother of pearl and I ended up with um, some, some strong blue through which looked quite beautiful but it's not what I wanted on my piece I just had contamination going through my brushes so we label the brushes and then we keep them in a plastic bag and that way we know that they are luster brushes um, and they they do really well I've got um, I thought that the that the brush hairs um, I mean, it's like perming your hair. The brush hairs are, the thinner is quite brutal to the brush hair. So after a while, you're going to need to replace your brushes because the hairs have gone brittle. But the brushes I've got in the bags here are from 2018 when I did a, quite a lot of workshops and um, they, they've been kept in a, a, in a bag um, and they seem to be, um, that then I'm not I've not opened up a bag of, of lots of loose hairs um, but yeah at the point there so no water keep it away from water um, and, it, and it's also when you're working you don't want to be breathing heavily over it but you sh 
because you can get moisture from your breath onto the luster but i may talk about that in a minute so what is this fish eye thing that you referred to what's the fish eye um it is as if somebody sneezed on it and pushed the luster away um it's like just little freckles of unlustered areas which on a mother of pearl you don't notice but on uh on a on a on writing that you might have done with gold or silver it just it's just little imperfections in the in the gold or the silver finish that just push away to whatever you've got underneath okay we may or may not be good with brushes and liner brushes, but oh my goodness, a gold pen is just the best thing when you're using lusters, and I'll show you how to use it. Um, we we use um, it works really well with lusters because lusters are such a fine consistency. Um, you could use it with other products, but don't don't cross contaminate. If you're using it for gold, just use it for gold and silver and mother of pearl and other lusters. Don't use it with other water based products. Um, it's got such a fine nozzle. Um, if you were to use water-based paints in it, the particles of the paints tend to get caught in the nozzle and it's ugly to use and you're constantly unblocking it with the, with the pin that comes with it. Um, I love it for, for writing with lusters. It just makes writing so easy and I'll show you how to use it in a minute. Um, we keep the gold pen in the bag with the with the brushes um, and uh, everything you've just read on there is how I'll, I'll show you in a minute that, um, how to actually use it. OK, so as we've said before, when you're using gold and silver um, for all lusters, we must make sure that it's applied to a clean fired surface and you can see the top tile there. Um, well, yeah, you, you can read all these notes, can't you? Um, well, yeah, so clean surface, using a brush or a gold pen, and we've diluted it. Now, on the top two tiles there, we've got silver or palladium. And in real life, it's so hard to show you on, in, on the camera or on the, or, you know, on the screen there. Um, you get a deeper silver when you apply the silver over blue. It looks pretty amazing on the clear glaze, but it looks so much deeper on the, on the blue. So if you're gonna do large areas, let's put a blue stroke and coat or a blue foundation down first. Or if you're doing a class with, your, with customers or, or projects yourself, paint the areas that you want to be silver blue you know on your on your bisque and glaze it and fire it and then when you come to do your luster work put your silver over the blue areas um, the next tiles show that um, putting gold over yellow makes the gold look richer in it and it really really does make it look just gorgeous it works well on clear glaze um, so the other tiles there if you get your if you dilute your gold down too much you're going to get the tile to the right hand side of the yellow um, it's just not going to look gold enough it's going to look a little bit brassy a little bit like you polished it too much um, if you don't get enough on you could put some more over the top and you could refire it um, but you don't want to do that. Um, and if you put the gold on too heavy, it crackles a little bit. It's given us a halo on the tile to the left hand side of my yellow chip. It's given it like a little purple halo around it. Now the purple halo is caused by too little gold on the piece. So you can see the bottom right um, gold smudge chip. That is where we've made a mistake and we've wiped it off. We've wiped the gold off and we thought we'd wiped the gold off completely, you know, completely, completely wiped away. You can't see any part of the gold there, but when fired, it leaves this pinky purple tinge. Um, so if you get gold in the wrong place, you need to wipe it off with a piece of kitchen towel. 
You then need to get a piece of kitchen towel with a little bit of thinner on it and then wipe the area with that. And then, you, and then a clean piece of kitchen towel again and then wipe over it again. Um, and you should be able to remove it. But it's not guaranteed. You still might see a smudge. Um, I remember this was on one of the uh, one of the throwdowns, and I remember feeling very pompous because I thought, "Oh, that's not going to work." Somebody had used the gold luster on a project, and then got it wrong, so just wiped it all off. And I thought, "Oh, this is going to make great television because that's not going to work," and it didn't. It came out all purpley, and they were all surprised. But um, what I just want to pick up on here is when you're the, the reason that gold pen is so good is trying to use a liner brush to do writing. Um, some of you guys are amazing at doing that, but it can be it can be quite tricky. If you use the uh, a liner brush and you get it wrong and you try and wipe it off, this is where you could see a remnant of that smudge. Um, so using that gold pen, you're less likely to make a mistake, um, which is where it really does come into its own. The Colorabia Gold's got so much gold in it that it works really well on the clear glaze. Um, it doesn't show very well on my screen there, but it is just a really beautiful gold. Um, oh yeah, so going back to what Matthew was saying about working with a brush, if you do leave any brush hair on your piece, then you do need to pick it off. It will leave um, uh, an ashy remnant behind um, and you will see it. You do need to be clean and tidy as clean and tidy as you can with uh, lusters and overglazes. I hope this isn't being like all negative. We're just, we're just <laughs> trying to highlight the problems so you don't have them. These are the things. It's, it's expensive and you don't want to get it wrong. Um, and it's a third firing. So a third firing is a risk. Um, Jane might have a slide about that, but it's a risk when you're um, firing a piece that's already glazed. So... Um, you want to get it right. So that's why we're just going into all these things. There's several people that have got audio issues popping up. Um, as I said, we are recording this, so don't worry. We will you know, send you out a link tomorrow so you can watch it all over again. Um, so this is this is what the pieces looked at looked like before and after firing. And this was with the silver. And it was, it was so hard to paint a brown luster onto a black piece. I just couldn't see it. I just couldn't see what I was doing. Um, so you can see the studs on the mug. They're a little bit messy on, uh, on the bottom left-hand mug with the studs on it. Um, and, so, and that was done with a brush, a, a script liner brush. And then the... Um, the right hand mug the top lip was painted with a liner brush on a banding wheel um i love the make the mako script liner brush it just holds so much color really well and uh, i went around a couple of times and you can see the color of the luster you know it's not running or dripping it's uh just that that, that beautiful um golden amber color and then I use the gold pen for the, the funny little spiky little flowers um, on it. Um, the gold was a little bit easier. My studs look a little bit better on that mug. Um, what I found interesting was actually on the mugs, putting a gold or a silver lip on the top of the mug really did finish the piece off. I mean, it makes quite a, you know, an okay piece look amazing. It just elevates the the piece to a completely different level so the mug on the right i used a gold pen and just roughly outlined um the areas with the gold pen it's just um just really quite cool um so i like accenting an, an existing design rather than painting a whole thing gold or silver taking a design that you've already created and just accenting a little bit. So the silk screens from Mako, they were quite, um, you know, they, they lend themselves to a little bit of accent. Um, the problem on doing these products, doing these pieces is that you use more product in the 
um, you know, and in the tool than you actually use on the piece a lot of the time. So you kind of do need to stock, um, you know, to, to collect up a few pieces and do it all in one go. So if you're going to do a workshop, um, use that tip about wherever people want to have gold, ask them to paint that area in gold, wherever they want silver, ask them to paint that bit of their design in silver. And then I would, I would do it as a service to the customer. I would, I would do the, the, the gold or the silver part of the process for them because you can take all the pieces out of the kiln, you can lay them out on the table and you can sit for an hour and do the luster work for the customer. You get a stinky studio for a short, short bit of time and you can take them out of the kiln do it and then put them straight back in the kiln and then the risk of contamination is really quite minimal so jane there's a really good question i don't know whether you cover it in your slideshow um is gold and silver food safe once it's fired um yeah no i was going to ask you that that question actually <laughs> <laughs> but um so it's it, so the so the gold and silver goes into the surface of the. Uh, oh, do you want me to? Yeah. So uh, the, the, when you're firing the gold and the silver, it's a lower temperature firing. So we're just um, we're we're just fixing a metal onto the surface of the glaze. So after the firing, you could get a screwdriver and rub it on the gold. I mean, you'd be an idiot but you could take the gold and the silver off with a screwdriver or a bit of sandpaper, it would come off. Well, actually, Matthew, do you remember our cleaner at the old property? You remember that huge jardinier in the entranceway? She, she was yeah. very enthusiastic at cleaning it and she managed to polish the gold off this massive jardinier. Yeah, well, it makes, now you must sort of clarify why we had a jardinier. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, we, you know, it's a long time ago, it was a really odd mold that we used to sell and to show off, we made this big jardinier thing and it was covered in gold. This was back in the eighties and nineties, it was allowed back then. But so what, what you're doing is you're putting a thin layer, like a gold leaf over the surface of your glazed item and it will be bonded to the surface of the glaze. It's not under the glaze. So that's the facts now whether that makes it food safe um that's another question and if you were to pick the gold and the silver off and consume it i would argue it's not going to do you any harm but i wouldn't suggest that it would make a piece a utility item if you had gold and silver on the surface of it so i would i would happily paint it on the outside of a mug um I would maybe not want to paint it on the rim of a mug, but on the rim of a bowl, um, you would put it on the, you can put it on the, the rim of a bowl because you're not going to be chewing the bowl. Um, yes, you can eat gold leaf, but it's just, I'm, I wouldn't want to encourage that. No, and I'm not sure it is good for you. I, I don't think it can do any harm. I'm not that um, decadent that I've tried it that often. Um, well, I, th I think they say that it's um, that it's not food safe because you could easily wear yeah. it off the piece, but it's not going to harm you. Um, it's, yeah, I think it's not durable. It's not durable enough for utility. That's probably how I would succinctly answer that. But I have a mug that I love at home, and it has a palladium handle, and it I, a, a potter made it for me, and I just adore it. And it started off as my hand wash only mug. And I've had it maybe three years now. And How much does, did you pay for it, Jane? <laughs> I paid thirty-five pounds for it, and I love it. I love it, love it, love it. And yes, I could have made it myself, but I love it. It makes me very happy every time I have my cup of tea out of it. So it's that's what it's all in, all about, isn't it? Um, but now that that mug goes in the dishwasher, and uh, it still has a palladium handle, still has a silver handle. So. Um, uh, but I think it's just worth being aware of the durability issue. It's not under the glaze, it's on top of the glaze. So it is going to be more vulnerable. I remember when we were kids, we had a uh, uh, a set, like a Sunday best set of plates that had gold on the, on the rim. And over the course of the years of using it, 
it all disappeared and it would have been that we probably consumed most of it over those over those years and look at us didn't do us any harm <laughs> okay um so there are many different lusters and when you look on our website um there is a page of different lusters i think the lusters that you want to play with first are gold silver and then mother of pearl um, mother of pearl is also another brown liquid that we can paint over anything else um, now the the shell dish um, was just a pink a purple blended dish just stroke and coat colors just blended together and it was okay but we put the mother of pearl over it and oh my goodness the way the light catches it i've got it here i'll show it to you um, on the camera in a, in a minute but it just looks gorgeous so yes you can put it over um we always used to say with mother of pearl it's what years ago before contemporary ceramics when we used to just do sort of traditional ceramics if somebody had produced a piece that looked quite plain cover it in mother of pearl and all of a sudden it makes a shiny glaze shine even more uh, and it was a good way i don't know if jane remembers that of covering up average finish and making it really really um, really stand out so mother of pearl can be used over over stroke and coat over foundations over most jungle gem glazes you just got to watch out well you can use mother of pearl over copper based um uh crystal glazes you're gonna you're gonna see copper in some of the green crystal glazes and i and I believe Mother of Pearl works. I don't think I've had any, any issues using Mother of Pearl over those copper glazes. But when you use gold on those, on anything that's got copper in it, the gold can go gunmetally. Something comes off the copper-based glazes and it, and it tarnishes pieces. Now, you can get some you know, something like Brasso, and you can clean that off the fired luster and it will brighten it up again. But that's quite an abrasive cleaner and you could go too far and you could take um, that tarnish, you, know, you could take tarnish off, but you can also start taking the luster off. So um, avoid copper-based glazes when you're using the lusters. But um, I, I'll show you these in real life in just a second. Um, they, they do just like Matthew said, they just elevate things to a different level. So any design work, any design work you do, you can put lusters over the top. Okay, so. That's not mother of pearl. I've just noticed that it's, that's gold and silver and that's silver. I know, but the horseshoe, the bit round its feet. So mother of pearl, round the horse's feet, we've got mother of pearl, it looks brown. And then the, the writing is silver. The writing is silver and the horn is silver. And the bit inside the ears was mother of pearl. How do you know the difference between each of these cut, um, lusters? You don't. You have to be quite uniformed and, uh, uh, you know, about what you're using and read the labels and tie everything up together. Did you say what happens if you put mother of pearl on too thick? I think, I think I'm going to show you that on the vase. Okay. But, um, yeah. I, yeah, I think the next one tells you this, this okay. maybe. Um, but just look at the unicorns. The the unicorn on the um, left hand side doesn't have mother of pearl on the tail, but and, and on the main. But the one on the right does have mother of pearl on it, and it just makes it gorgeous. It's the smallest amount of product that we've used on these unicorns, and they're just delicious. They're just just really quite lovely. And this was the Christmas tree that I'll show you again in real life. But just want you, you know, beforehand, it looks like the left-hand picture. And then afterwards, I'll show you in real life. The picture doesn't do it justice. Um, but so in areas, the luster wants to run. And when you're applying it, you're going to, you really do brush it out. It, it, it wants to go on quite thin. Um, so it doesn't want to be dark brown. It wants to be this quite light colour as you're applying it. Uh, but again, I can show you that. 
and I have the mug. I was trying to show you on the mug handle here um, where I've got the luster, the, the mother of pearl on a little bit too thick. And when the mother of pearl goes on a little bit thick, um, it goes to powder It's when it's fired. So if luster is applied too thick, it doesn't stick to the glaze. It sticks to itself and it becomes a chalky powder. And after firing, it just comes off in your hand. Um, so the drip inside the handle there, that is too thick. That little dark patch there is too thick. The main body of the mug that you can see on the right hand side, um, that's the right consistency. It's a very fine detail now. Um, mother of pearl you brush it out until you think there's nothing on there almost so it was a half inch glaze brush um, which again I'll show you in a second and it was just one full half inch glaze brush full of mother of pearl that I used on this mug and I'll show you in the mug in a second um, but yeah interesting so in answer to the question earlier, can you use mother of pearl on matte glazes? Yes, you can. Um, and lusters, you can use you can use all your view lusters onto uh, whatever glaze. Now, the gold and the silver look pretty cool on top of the matte glaze. That is matte foundations, and it just reflects whatever glaze surface that you put it on. So that looks quite cool. The mother of pearl on the black mat, that nah, doesn't look so cool, does it? That looks a bit boring. But the swish across the middle of that plate, that was just regular dipping glaze painted as, as a swish over the top of the matte black. So that plate, sorry, let me backtrack. The plate was done with foundation, black matte all over three coats. Then I got a glaze brush and I did a swish of normal regular dipping glaze just across the middle there. And then I fired it to my cone 06. And then I used mother of pearl over the entire piece. And we got that effect. Now I don't like the mother of pearl on top of the matte black, but I love the mother of pearl on top of the gloss. And what this shows you is if you apply the mother of pearl in a swirling sort of motion as well, um, the brush strokes show through and you get a little bit of that oil slick pattern that you can see on that piece by twisting and turning your brush. And we want to see the brush strokes. So it's different to um, working with your normal glazes. We don't want to see the brush strokes normally, but with the mother of pearl, we do. Um, but these in real life, these are quite lovely to to actually touch, um, quite interesting. Um, there's lots of different other lust colored lusters there um, available. Um, on the first mug in the picture there, the green luster was applied too heavily and you, that's what you can see the, the white lines, the, the luster stuck to itself um, rather than to the piece. And what we can also see on these, on the two on the green luster and the orange luster mug is we had areas of clear glaze and areas of just glossy black and the lusters are transparent so they take on a little bit of whatever is underneath the piece so um, on on the left hand and middle mug we painted the handle area black and then clear glazed it and fired it and then we put the coloured luster all over the body of the mug. And we had, we did brush strokes. We did twists and turns with our brush. So you can sort of, that's how you get the different shapes and textures in it. Um, and it looks quite, looks quite interesting. Um, the third mug was violet and yellow luster. And then I put gold luster around the, the tip and they, they sort of repel each other. Um, when they're not dry and they stay tacky forever um, so you've got to be quite smart on, on how you apply them uh, I, I don't like the violet and yellow one um, it looks quite dated it looks quite 
1970s ish um, but on that mug where we can see the bleeding of the gold that's where the lusters weren't dry they were they were too wet and they just bled into each other far too easily so we must leave them to dry between different applications but again i'll show you that in just a sec um, marbling we're not going to do today but marbleizing marbleizing agent is a product that um, you can put over your luster and it breaks it up and it crackles it um, so the gecko was painted with stroke and coat and it was it was actually three coats and we didn't put any clear glaze over the top because we just fired it because it was enough glaze in in it to just use it by itself and there is actually black luster on there on the body and then violet was on the feet uh, of the of the gecko and then you let the luster pretty much dry and then you put the marbleizing agent over the top and it repels and pushes the luster around and it makes this random crackling effect it's gorgeous um and it's so random though uh it it's not a guaranteed finish it's a play when you've got nothing else to do it's, i don't think it's a workshop um class it works really well with um gold and black and uh and violet I think gold oh, and silver it works for so the most expensive lusters it works with the cheaper lusters I couldn't get it to work very well um, but you can see in the picture on the top right there violet is the is the first chip black is the second chip red is okay it works okay the the third sorry the fourth one is the gold and that that worked well actually mother of pearl is the next one and that did also work as well but I don't know it's uh it's a product for another day. Um, the marbleizing agent isn't it isn't expensive at all, but it's you need to use it over the top of your lusters, and it and it just uh, pushes the product pushes the luster around and makes it craze. It's fun, um, but not something I'd start off with. Uh, this. These are showing different applications of luster. So the first three vases, I applied the, the, they were just white vases, white clear glazed vases. And I applied the luster with, um, on a banding wheel. So we've got a nice smooth application and you can see the bottom half of the yellow vase is lovely and smooth. And then the bands on the gold are lovely and smooth and the, and, the violet luster on the third one, the luster was a little bit thick. It was a little bit sticky um, when we came to use it. So that's why you can see some of the brush strokes. Um, but overall, yeah, they look quite cool. They look quite good. When we applied the luster in a random fashion, um, you can see that on the, um, the fourth and fifth bars, the violet and the green bars, you can see your brush strokes. So it's so important that you get the consistency of the luster right um, and not too sticky it wants to it wants to flow off the brush and i'll show you in a i'll show you shortly what that looks like um, but well, then we use marbleizer over half the vase to get it to crackle up and it's, it's interesting it's not my favorite thing but um that's what marbleizer is it pushes it around and gets it to crackle we're not using it today but just to show you what it is um, and a bit of a point that I made earlier was the lusters look the same. They, they're all a brownie colour. So you really need to be, you really need to make sure you know what you're using. Um, and also you can see on the first bars, uh, the bluey bits that are dripping down, that is the marbleizer that I'd use over the top. You've got to tidy yourself up before you firing, before you fire. Um, any little residue left behind, um, it, you see it on the end piece so just uh just work tidy work neat and uh don't work with thick luster the bottom picture shows the brushed on luster rather than the banded lusters and you can see my brush strokes beforehand and the product doesn't it, it, it doesn't improve with the colored lusters um that uh the the first, the left-hand side of the bottom picture, 
that's what it looked like before. And then you can see back on this picture, the violet bars. It's not that exciting, is it? It didn't look good before and it doesn't look good after. So you can, I needed to have a thinner product that's too heavier application. The, the, the product, the luster wasn't the right consistency on that. And then this was just a piece decorated in several different ways. And um, basically mother of pearl just makes, made them look really quite cool. Uh, the texture that was on the piece um, just with mother of pearl on just the light just catches it beautifully. Um, and yeah, and I've said about the copper. Yeah, so that's not too exciting. Okay, right. Lots of, lots of talking there. Lots of talking. Right. So, so um, I'm a bit of a messy worker. Um, so I have to be quite careful about how I work. Uh, I want to change the camera to to this one right this is me okay so this is quite a neat trick this is play-doh on a little tray so where you've got your little tiny um containers if you put that in your play-doh clumsy little me is not going to knock it over which i think is quite a genius thing i can't remember who i stole that from but that's um, that's not my idea that's somebody else's idea okay so the gold and the palladium <laughs> the gold and the palladium are ridiculously expensive for ridiculously expensive for, for quite a small little container but i we i don't know if you've been over this but it's it's actual gold you know and it's actual palladium and it the price goes up and down um on on the gold price when the gold price is is high then the the price of, of gold goes up um and colorobia the company that we buy this from they are um they're quite deep into the whole resources of, of not just making the product but mining for uh, various materials that are in these things so um they, they are beautiful and we can get the gold that we have is it 10 percent the um percentage of gold in it we can get various percentages and actually the, the greater percentage doesn't actually look better than uh the one that we've chosen to go with yeah i think it's 10 percent um gold which does mean um with adding thinner you can make it down to whatever consistency um you want and that works well with you um so I use cocktail sticks to work with the luster. And um, this is actually a red luster. Um, so how can I show you this? Maybe I need to maybe I need to get back up to the other camera to show you this. So uh, seamlessly done. <laughs> Um, it's this is a little bit thick. How can I show you this? Is it here? It's a little bit thick. This is it's it's almost there, but it's a bit syrupy. Um, now, yeah, with a first when you first open the luster, it is a little bit on the thicker side. So it would be like this luster that I've got here. It, it it's just a bit sticky it's almost right but it's just a little bit sticky um the picture i showed you before was a gold that i had i hadn't used for a, quite a while and it was it was really marmite consistency so with this sort of consistency um i would take my brush um she's um, I take my brush and I dip it into, take my brush and I dip it into the thinner. So I've got a brush full and it's like, I've got a brush full and then I'm just going to wipe the brush on the edge of the 
popped and I'm going to go dip it just dipping in again into the thinner and then just wiping it on the edge of the pot. Now I put my brush down onto a piece of uh, piece of kitchen roll. I've got a bit of kitchen roll. I'm going to put my brush down onto that um, because I just I just get it everywhere. Um, I've actually also got a pair of gloves here. I might when I come to cleaning the brushes, I might actually go to um, to wear my gloves. And then I put the lid back on the thinner because uh, I've done workshops here before and I've just kind of knocked the brush cleaner and the thinner um, across the table. Um, so you just give it a bit of a mix. And that this is still as hard. I can't show you that. You can't see. It. I think I can see it dripping. And it's still a little bit sticky. This just a tiny bit sticky. So again, I'm going to just get just. It feels like you're not adding very much at all. Um, but it's best to go cautiously rather than, you know, trying to pour a whole load in. Let's do three brushfuls there. Oh, my brush runs straight off the kitchen roll. Typical. Um, then I'm going to give it another mix. But yeah, your the new gold and the new silver and the new mother of pearl that you've got um, is going to be a little bit on the thick side. So, so just on this, why are you mixing it with a cocktail stick and not shaking it vigorously? Yeah, good point. Um, we don't want to get any air bubbles into the luster. If we get air bubbles into the luster, we're going to see those on the finished piece. Um, and we don't want that. So it's a bit like those brush strokes I showed you on the vases. Um, we don't want to see any of them. So, so all of a sudden, it goes nice and drippy. It's nice and it's a nice drippy consistency. How do we describe that? It's got a good viscosity there. So it's definite drips. That's what we want. That's that's the right consistency. Um, this is actually red luster, and I don't want to use red luster. Um, I realised I'd mixed up all my all my lusters, but that, that that's that's the consistency that we want. So um, let's do let's do mother of pearl, shall I? Do mother of pearl, yeah. So um, I've got a big bottle of mother of pearl. Um, you've got smaller bottles of mother of pearl. Um, I when I get a, a new um, when I pick up a brush, I just wipe it onto the, the, the paper towel just to make sure I've got no loose hairs on um, coming out of the brush. If it's the brushes, like I said, they do die. It's like you're perming your hair. Um, you, you can make the brush hairs brittle after a period of time. Um, so I am just going to pop my whole brush into the bottle of luster. So I've got a foot well, can you see how lovely that is? That's just a lovely consistency. Um, this is the right consistency. So I would have just added um, thinner to the mother of pearl until it was the right consistency, just like I showed you just then. And then, so this is one brush full. And so this piece, this piece I have here is uh, the new mug from Mako. And I've put, uh, I've put um, uh, number 12 all over it and then wiped it off. And then I've used the foundation uh, diamond blue over it and fired it to Kono 6. And I haven't touched the outside of the piece. I have just, um, uh, just handled it on the inside. So this area here, that would be too thick. Okay, that's too heavy a replication but I can brush it out. I can keep on brushing it out and I can go in any, each and every direction. So I kind of want to see my brush strokes a little bit here. I want to lift up some of that luster from there. And this is quite tricky because it's got all of these little um, texture bits that, it want, that the luster wants to go into. So we're going to just take it all around. You want to do this when the paint's still wet. Don't let it dry and then think, oh, that's too thick and I'll just touch it with a brush because then you'll just end up wiping it all off rather than moving it around on the piece. Yes, I, I'm trying to be clever. I'm trying to make one brush full reach all the way around the piece, which it did on the sample that I'm going to show you in a minute. Is that just one loading? 
this is one um one, one brush, brush no. yeah so this is a this is the hobby ceramic craft um half inch luster brush natural hair we're using a natural hair because it holds the luster really really well um and uh um it distributes luster quite well so i'm just trying to get around there pick up those bits from around here so i'm eking it out just a tiny bit but just trying to make a point that um this is fine so it's not on thick at all is it it's not it's not a heavy application at all but oh look there's a hair there a loose hair i just got loose hair you can't see that i can't show you that oh there is honestly there's a loose hair just there I just lifted that up in my brush. So this is what it looks like um, before it's fired. And I'm going to hold the handle. And where's my after? So that's the after. Hold on. Look at that. So isn't that just gorgeous? I just love the turquoisey, greeny colors in there. The light just reflects off it. And honestly, it is that, okay? So you saw what it looked like beforehand. And I, we just painted one brush full of the mother of pearl all over, um, all out, over the outside. I haven't done the inside. I'm not gonna put it on the inside because I'm worried about the durability of the product and it will wear off. But on the outside, it's just delicious. It's just fun. Um, the mother of pearl is an expensive product and you can, you can easily do that. So let me show you some other mother of pearl um, pieces. So that came to, you almost sounded like you said it is. It's it's not an expensive product. It's it not. Anyway? Yeah, it's not an expensive product. Um, I need to put the lid back on there, and I'm going to wash the brush in a moment. So the lids lids gone back on my mother of pearl. Um, so mother of pearl over. Should I switch cameras? I think I need to switch cameras because that's not the best camera, is it? Is that going to sleep now, that camera? Yeah, just touch the shutter button. Touch the shutter button, that one? Yeah. Oh, it likes to sing, doesn't it? Yeah, good. Okay, so this is... Um, uh, we've got a... An element glaze 103 uh, as the base glaze on the background there and then we've got a crystal glaze um, cg 967 so cg 967 without um without mother of pearl looks pretty cool it, 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 which is this area here it's quite quite lovely but with mother of pearl it's just just love it it's just delicious it's just a different level and it's um and we've used it over the green. Um, we've used Mother of Pearl over the green. And it's, so that's, you can see Mother, can you see it? I don't know whether you can yeah, see Yeah, you can, you can see yeah. like a rainbow spectrum of like yeah. an oil spill yeah. of it's color. It's just gorgeous. Um, just messing around with that. We've got, so that's the tree without um, Mother of Pearl on it. And then this is the tree with Mother of Pearl. Do you see what I was saying? It just seems to make, glaze shine more which is a strange thing to say but it really does and that was as easy as i just showed you with the mother of pearl it was just that easy um this one was just trying to show you the brush strokes it was a plain piece with um just clear glaze all over it and just different patterns of mother of pearl it's um, quite hard to see actually on the camera. Okay. And there was areas where we got it thick and it's a bit dry. Um, yeah, in real life, that looks, that's interesting to look at. But yeah, that's hard, isn't it? White on white's not, not good. Um, this was the unicorn. So it just makes it a little bit more, more lustrous, doesn't it? Um, so this one is, this one is no mother of pearl. You can see the colours are quite beautiful, but flat. And then this one is with Mother of Pearl. It's just different, isn't it? I just love it. And I did round his feet as well, gave him like little splashes up his feet. And then we used 
the silver on the horn and then then the the writing then the writing on his feet so um, i really do feel i did say in the email that with with lusters like this it's it's almost directly as as a detail accent it's sort of directly related to how beautiful it looks that that a small amount of gilding I mean, you're going to prove me wrong with this Pegasus now because it's covered in the stuff. But with the gold and silver accents, you can really make a piece look beautiful. If you put a lot on, it can make it look a bit chintzy. But I grant you that. That, uh, but it's more particular with gold and silver. Mother of pearl, you can get away with. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's with. quite. It's quite a boring piece. I mean, it was just painted with um, stroke and coat all over. Um, stroke and coat number fifty-eight all over, wiped off. Um, just leaving the blue in the crevices and then clear glazed. And it looked, it was fine. It was like this one, it was pretty flat. It looked, looked cool, but then you just put Mother of Pearl over and it just, oh, just quite exciting, quite lovely. Um, and yeah, the dishes, the soap dish, that was the, it, it looked flat. It was like this beforehand. And then by putting the Mother of Pearl over the top, it looks quite good. Over time, I know that the Mother of Pearl wore off on a sample, one of these that we had just through usage. So maybe an actual soap dish that you're going to use a lot in a high volume area. It's probably, you know, the, the food safety thing comes in. It's not, not that it's not food. It's not that it's going to poison you. It's just going to wear off. And um, so you just got to think about the durability of the item. Uh, and what else have I got? This piece here, this is quite cool. Um, this is quite a cool piece. So this piece is um, painted the whole thing with Mako Astro Gems or Mako Black uh, Fundamental Underglaze. Paint the whole thing, three coats of it. Then you get wax resist on a sponge and then you sponge wax resist in an in a open texture pattern all over the piece. And in the top area here, I didn't put any wax in this area. I then glazed it. So where the wax was, there was no glaze. So we, we had dry areas where, um, so the wax protected the underglazed or the astrogem area. So if, Mako fundamentals require a clear glaze to make them shiny. Um, they are a colored slip or an engobe. Once it was fired to the glaze temperature, we then put mother of pearl all over the entire thing and then fired it to the Kono 18 and it did this. And this is just exciting. I love it, makes me very happy. Um, got just regular clear glaze on the inside, um, but brilliant. And we did it with the black astro gem and then the white astro gem and it was on this piece I had a contaminated luster brush which you can just see elements of that there it doesn't look bad but it's not what I intended you can see that was my mother of pearl brush that was contaminated with a, um, a different luster but you can't see that one but just different colors all colors look quite exciting with the mother of pearl over the top so you could use a fundamental underglaze all over three coats, wax to protect the areas that you don't want any clear glaze on, clear glaze the inside and the top edge and, and uh, where you see the shiny bits, that's where the clear glaze was. Fired to Kono 6, the wax burns off, mother of pearl over the entire thing. And it does this and it's a, quite a fun product. This is the Biskin Ports uh, Juliana bars, which is quite fun. Uh, mother of pearl over black. So just that's just black, it's a bit boring, but mother of pearl over, over black. And you can see that my brush stroke was a bit of a zigzag pattern there. And it just picks up the, the all slip colors. I love it, really quite good. Last bit of mother of pearl, I suppose. You know, this is, uh, oh, you can't see that. That looks really good. That's um, a sheer foundation. But you can't see it, that's no good. Can't show you that one. Uh, maybe you can see the handle there. So the whole thing is just painted in a regular fashion, but just we've just put Mother Pearl 
on the handle and it's just a little bit just elevates it right well and we've got it on the inside of the little jug as well but you can't it just around the top um katie just put it there just as a to make a little trio set but yeah uh, and this that was the mother of pearl on top of the black mat so that's the matte foundation and then uh, that this area here has got the clear glaze on it fired to Kono 6 and then mother of pearl over the entire thing so mother of pearl over white uh, over the matte looks a bit rubbish but mother of pearl over a glossy black looks quite cool but we already know that because it's already shown you that right so uh, well just on before you finish off showing that just grab that cone the banded cone color over of ours the big tall one just on your right there yeah, okay. Well, it just, I, I think you can really make uh, a, a plate or, or a bowl just reach another level just by banding uh, a gold or a silver band. Um, we used to sell um, more gold because it was gold and people liked the gold and like gilding things and thinking that it made things look much more classy by banding a a, a band of gold on the rim of a plate but if you've got a, a piece like a plate with a lot of white bisque uh, exposed so clear glazed bisque if you use the palladium the silver just as the band your eye hardly sees that silver band and I know it's another firing but it it can make a piece that looks good just trust me it just looks amazing and more so than sil uh, than gold i would say gold you see the gold but the silver it's just a very subtle but beautiful um border or frame to put onto a, a clear glaze piece okay so the gold pen we love the gold pen um the gold pen is um is a tool that comes like this um i keep it in the packaging so i, I um I keep it nice and neat. Uh, this part of it is just a needle tool um, that you can, that you, just a needle tool um, that you can use to clean the, um, what's out of focus, isn't that rubbish? Sorry about that, but you can see what I'm talking about, can't you? Um, so what we have here is we have a well that we need to put the luster into this area here and then we're going to write with the um with a gold pen like so so how do you fill up the the tool well i need to get a clean cocktail stick and uh i'm going to use the silver the palladium and uh just going to look at the consistency of it so the consistency is i think okay yeah it's got a nice strip to it maybe a tiny bit sticky mm. this is it just needs to be um mixed up and just a little bit just so we can see what the actual consist that's a tiny bit sticky maybe i'll just put a little drop of thinner in it um down my thinner is this one. And I need a brush that is the right brush. Gold, gold, gold. Silver. Okay. So I'm just taking my, my brush that I'm using for silver and I'm just dipping it into the thinner and then I'm just going to tip it onto the edge there. Because you, um, you leave the lid off the jar for a little bit, it evaporates. So that's why you need to add thinner back to it at various different times. Um, so we're just gonna do that. And we're just gonna use the cocktail stick that I used for the silver. Just give it a little bit of a mix. Oh, that's better. That's better. It's just a tiny bit different. And it's really hard to show you. Right, yeah, it's just dripping off. It's not too sticky. Hold it, just hold it above the paper and just let it drip into the bottle. Then we can see it dripping. It's not dripping. Hang 
Boom. There we are. <laughs> Is that good enough? Oh, it's so hard to show you. Sorry, folks. And normally when we do this in the studio, I normally go around and show groups of two or three people at a time. So um, I'm using the Play-Doh to hold the bottle still, and then I'm using my cocktail stick to load, load the gold pen. Um, again, it seems a bit of a long-winded way of loading it, but trust me, when you try and pour it into your well, you're going to make a right mess of it. Well, I don't know. I do. I don't want you to waste the product. Um, so I'm just getting rid of the excess there. Find the lid, put the lid back on the silver, put the silver lid back on the silver jar, not with the gold jar. And then, uh, so I've got this mug here. And you just, you're just going to write with it, you know, or do little doodles with it, writing on the surface. I like the little broken line. So is your tip, is it actually rubbing on the surface of the... It is. I do. It has. It is right on the surface. The camera's a bit out of focus, isn't it? But you can. So I'm using my little finger for support, aren't I? There, and you can. It's really slippery. Uh, you you can just do sort of like rough outlines. Um, if you're finding it's too sticky. Um, you can add a little bit more thinner to it, but it is, it's kind of the right consistency, I would say. Now, this is a bit boring watching me do this, isn't it? And you can't really see because the camera's in that focus, which is a bit rubbish. But we could just, that's, that's what it looks like. Um, should I flip it onto the other camera? And that is that the other camera might be good. So, technical way of holding the gold pen <laughs> so is this one better can you see that or not matthew what's that like i think we could we could go on stop stop i think the the lighting's worse on this one i think we get the gist of what you're doing okay I, but we're just we're just using the gold pen just like so okay <laughs> Okay, right, sorry, uh, let's go back. Do you want to try writing on the bottom so they can see you writing with it? Is that too much pressure? <laughs> I don't know, I think I'd probably do that. Oops. Might practice. Uh, Matthew, if I'm going to use uh, a banding wheel, I haven't got a banding wheel out. Am I going to use a banding wheel? With the pen. You need a brush, don't you? I have brushes here. I just don't have a banding wheel. I tidied it up. Hey, bye, Jay. It's actually closer to you than it is to me. Is that? But I will get up because you're working. Yeah, I'm doing all the work. Oh, it's really rubbishly written. Sorry, folks. But anyway. Anyway, so I just use my little finger for support. And you folks have got much be more beautiful handwriting than, um, than me. But uh, there we go. Um, so I've actually got loads of gold left, uh, loads of um, silver left in that gold pen. So normally I would carry on using it. Um, and you just keep on refilling it using the cocktail stick. Um, to do the banding on the top, I'm just this is a banding wheel with various different banding wheels. And um, what did I use? That? I used that brush for the thinner, didn't I? Okay, let's just, when you're, if you use the brush for the thinner, you need to, um, I'll show you cleaning in a second. Um, I'll just show you how to do the, the banding on the top and then, uh, then I'll clean everything. So um, I use, just use my brush to add, oh, did I use the right one? Yeah, I did. Um, I just wanna make sure that it's clean. That I've got rid of the thinner that's 
I want to make it rid of the thinner that's in it. So make sure my brush is dry and clear of thinner. Okay, so. Oh, Matthew's messing with the camera. I wonder if it's better. If you just hold it. Ah, oh, that way. Okay, so. So I've fully loaded the, the brush with luster. And this is no pressure, is it? No pressure. Right, so um, my non-brush holding hand is walking under the banding wheel like so. It's walking under. I'm right-handed, so I'm holding the brush with my right hand and I'm turning the it's, it's nice if it's cent centered, but it doesn't have to be perfectly centered. And I'm just, I'm just going to hold the brush in place. And it goes something like that. Now the brush is dragging. The brush feels sticky and is dragging, so I've run out of product. So I need to get more on my brush to go around again. Um, so it goes, I'm just turning, 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 turning until I've got a nice consistent um, band. Now the problem with these mugs is that they are not going to be perfectly round. They've got thick and they've got thin um, edges. So no matter how you try and get it centered, um, dead center on your banding wheel, it's going to be really quite tricky to get perfectly centered. Um, so you're going to have to sort of let your brush compensate for it. So I've got an even application of um, luster around the piece. It's a little bit thick in some places. Let's see, it's a good job I've got my glasses on. Trying to get rid of the thicker areas, but I think that'll do. Woo, gone down a little bit. I think that'll do. And that was silver, was it? That's silver. It's exactly the same whether we use silver or gold, it doesn't matter. But that's, that's silver. Um, so there you go. Right, so lid back on the product. And then how do we clean the brushes? How do we clean your tools? Um, so again, so the brush I used on that was um, a Mako script liner brush. So how do we clean the, 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 the thing, the brushes? So you're gonna wipe the, um, gonna wipe the excess luster out on to a piece of kitchen towel and you're going to wipe it out as much as you can okay and i've got two bits of i've got several bits of newsprint here um, because i'm quite good at uh getting stuff everywhere um and i've got the uh the brush cleaner and then i'm just dipping my brush into the brush cleaner and then i'm wiping the brush backwards and forwards and getting the um, the luster off the ferrule edge there, okay. And then it's almost dry, isn't it? There, it's almost dry. Nothing coming off the brush. Stroking the brush, um, not messing the hairs up, but just stroking it backwards and forwards. And then I'm dipping into the cleaner again, and then wiping it again. So it's gone from this colour, and it's going to definitely more of an orange. Um, uh, orange colour, which is what the colour in the bottle is. And let's just check again. Oh, that's just perfectly. So that's how we clean a brush. Okay. That's how we clean a brush. And let's just check that it is clean. Well, there's a little bit of dark brown around the ferrule there. Give it a squidge out again. So this is how, this is why I, I'm a little bit lazy. I can see a little bit of brown around the edge there, but because this is a brush I've used for silver, I've labeled my brush silver, I'm gonna use it for silver again. I would probably leave that as being clean enough. And I'll put it back in my, my bag of brushes. Gone back in my bag of brushes and that's, that's good. Now, the, um, the gold pen, how do I clean that? Well, I'm going to fill it with um, I'm going to fill it with brush cleaner, but I'm probably going to have to use. Actually, I'll get the brush out that I just used. Um, I'm going to put brush cleaner into my well, 
and then I'm going to write with the um, the tool until it gets clean. I get a bit lazy. I get bored doing this. Just check that there. See that I just oh, just push some of the luster through there. That was um, uh, that was silver in there. Oh, I got something in there. A bit of stickiness maybe. So you, you could just write, write and 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 write with it. Or you can get a cotton bud and you could push a cotton bud in there. Or I use a little bit of kitchen roll and I can soak out some of the luster that I left in there. Just twiddling it around a little bit and just soaking and just pulling it out. And then I could put, that was my brush cleaner brush put some more brush cleaner in it then I can write it so it's still brown it's still brown I want it to come out um I want it to come out orange still brown but this is why you want to um you want to put all your stuff together um you know this is the cleaning bit it's the boring bit Come on. Um, so one thing that I meant to say and I didn't say properly was the um, the risk of your piece of breaking on the lust of firing is increased. Um, statistically, it's a one in 14 chance of a piece breaking on its third piece. And normally when you, normally the piece has been fired from um, greenware to bisque that's its first firing and then you fire it from bisque to glaze and then we're doing the luster firing is its third firing um oh i had a lot of luster in there come on and it's on the third firing it's more risky now you're going to touch up and you're going to refire a lot of your pottery pieces on on, on the third firing but it's going to be a, a calculated risk isn't it if you need to fix uh, somebody's piece um most often it's a you know a little you know kid's birthday party piece or a plate is a small plate and that's fine the pieces that you're going to put lusters on tend to be the more special pieces well look you can see the lust the, the cleaner is actually coming through now look at this it's changed isn't it that's gone to more orange and more fast flowing less sticky and that is nice that is that is now coming through all orange so, so I can i just pick up on the firing thing that um we're getting distracted it, yeah it was just to finish the point that it is a more stressful firing a third firing than your second firing the heat has to get through your hard shell of glaze that you've successfully put on the piece in the previous firing so heat travels in a different way into the the center of the piece so you need to be slightly more cautious um with firing than you would be on the previous glaze firing this is where you can have things cracking in the firing um, as with so many firing issues if you're in doubt slow it down you won't make a mess by firing something slower generally um, and also don't cram things generally you won't be cramming things in a overglaze firing because you're not going to have too many pieces to fire so it'll be quite a, uh, a, a relatively empty kiln firing um, but just make sure things are spaced apart your glaze is going to be going tacky so you still need to consider dry footing or stilting if you've stilted the piece you still need to do that uh, fire it slowly if you can um, give it space in the kiln um, make sure the kiln is well ventilated we've kind of labored that point but you think this stinks now wait till you fire oh boy it's awful in the kiln it stinks and oxygen kiln needs oxygen gold needs oxygen to zing to, to really sparkle if you don't have good ventilation in the kiln you're uh, you're well you, you're unlikely to see a major difference because the 
Kionis has said it's unlikely to be crammed, but do make sure you are firing with ventilation to and from the kiln. So you clean the mother of pearl brush in exactly the same way and you clean all the other brushes in exactly the same way. Um, that is it, I think. Uh, yeah, that's, that's it. So um, I saw questions flash up there, Matthew. Well, let me just jump on them. So um, I, I would go, it depends what your slow or your fast is. Um, generally, the medium firing with our kilns is fine. But as I said, if ever I'm not sure, and if it's on a platter or a bigger piece, I'm just going slow anyway. I'm just going slow anyway. And LP that made a point about uh, leaving the kiln open while firing. That's really interesting you made that point. In America, years and years ago, they used to tell us that when you start these firings for the first few hundred degrees, leave the, the, um, the lid open. And we said, well, you know, you can't you can't leave the lids open but in america you can have a lid that fully opens during the firing and for the first couple of hours they would literally do that on the last of firing the lid would be fully open and they would have um the oxygen dumping into the kiln so that's yes um lp there nicole is it right to have the lid propped open well it's ventilation, it's getting oxygen into the kiln. So is that right? Yes, it is, it's, it, it helps. But as I said, and my point might not be as relevant because the chances are you might only be firing two mugs, for example, in an empty kiln. And that by virtue of it being an empty kiln, it's gonna be getting enough oxygen anyway because it's not crowded. Well, that's actually a, a valid point actually, because when you do your sample pieces, often you've only got um, one or two pieces that you're firing um, and when you're doing a class you'll have you know 12 pieces and it's just making sure that when you load the kiln that you um, you evenly load the kiln so um, you don't just pop everything on the floor of the kiln you you know if, you, if you've only got a couple of pieces to fire pop them uh, on a shelf halfway up the kiln so that they're getting a nice true firing of the um, whatever your thermal, you know, wherever your thermocouple is, if, if you've just got a couple of pieces, put a shelf in same level as your thermocouple, because that's going to give you a true firing rather than popping them on the floor of the kiln. And uh, that's not going to give you a true firing. Um, when you've got a, a class full of work, um, evenly spread it throughout the kiln and just make sure that each piece is being evenly heated, that it's not being put under under any additional stress or strain by being too close to the element. If it's too close to the wall of the kiln and one part of the piece is getting cooked or getting heated hotter than the other, it wouldn't be uncommon for you to see um, a C-shaped crack on a plate where that edge is getting cooked too hot and it's putting that extra strain or stress across the piece. So um, don't overfill your kiln, um, give everything good ventilation and good even heating space. Um, you know, at least one element to each shelf, um, two elements to whatever's on the floor of the kiln, definitely. Um, I can't remember whether I've cleaned this brush or not. I'm using the same space to go to do my dirty part of the brush and then I'm coming towards me and getting cleaner. And I think it is. Yeah, I think that one's clean. Um, so they go in my bag, the lid goes back on, and then I have all my lusters live in a box like this, and all my brushes are in. Um, I've got most of my, 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 my things in bags, and then I have a, a lid that goes um, on my box, and it lives uh, on a shelf in the in the art room and it's nicely out of the way and I do use the lid as a work table as well for it but I think that's everything that I have to say so if anybody's got any questions that I haven't okay, asked, what I'll do now is I'll stop the recording